Okay, um, welcome everyone to Future Rural Symposium. Today's symposium is the outcome of a research trip I conducted with generous funding from Sasako Foundation last year. With my family, I traveled to what I would like to call resistance, resistance points. Uh, this research work led to the exhibition I curated for London Design Biennale at Somerset House during last year, and now to this symposium at AA. So I'm excited to introduce you to many speakers today. Uh, before I hand over the microphone to the first speaker, however, I would like to clarify what we mean by rural when we talk about what we think of it in Japan, which is the focus of today's symposium, although we will cover areas beyond Japan. <clears throat> I've got to <laughs> be dexterous. Um, <clears throat> so when we talk about rural here in the West, we usually imagine a place with abundant nature and hardly any sign of human habitation. Rural means lack of infrastructure, right? <clears throat> when we say inaka or rural in Japan, that is not necessarily the case. If we examine the Japanese word, um, Japanese characters there, um, the first character you see is, uh, means field, <clears throat> and the bottom one means huts. So literally, inaka means huts in the field. Rural in Japan means a kind of in-between place between densely populated area on flat plains and the wilderness of inaccessible high mountains. Inaka is not, therefore, nothingness. It is where people have lived and dwelt for centuries, making use of whatever nature offered. Here's a drawing I found on the internet uh, depicting this concept very well. During today's symposium, you will hear many times the Japanese word satoyama, this is an interesting word that has no equivalent in English. In fact, I have asked our simultaneous translators, Kozue Etsuzen and Kenji Nagoshi, uh, not to translate the word, but use the Japanese word as is. At the bottom of this picture, you will see Heia or the flatland. It's where most people live in Japan. Mega cities like Tokyo, Osaka, Nagoya have all evolved in Heia or the flatlands. Okuyama is what we might say in English, the hinterland. It's where animals and various gods, Shinto gods mostly, dwell in. It's where hermits might live in caves. People, however, don't live in Okuyama. Some mountains are even forbidden to women folks because they are deemed sacred, the mountains, Okuyama, and women are considered impure at least in the olden days, hopefully not anymore. <laughs> Oops. Wait. So there is Satoyama, the place in between these two realms. You will see that this is where a lot of speakers today dwell in. So please remember this drawing and the word Satoyama. Um, this is a photo of the area just outside the waste zero town of Kamikatsu village in Shikoku, where we visited last summer. This is located a little higher than Kamikatsu village, actually, therefore a little closer to Okuyama. You can see the old timber mill that Tanaka-san, who will speak later on today, has reused as a factory to start producing craft beer to generate income for the local people. You can also see the beer tasting hut the London-based architecture collective assemble has designed for Tanaka-san and built together with the local people. This is a photo of Tsukamoto-san um, of Tokyo-based architecture practice Atelier Bawao, walking up to Tanada office which he designed with his students from Tokyo Institute of Technology with support from Muji. You see here the remnant of terraced farming landscape called Tanada, cultivated over 1,000 year period. It was roughly 1,000 years ago, agriculture was introduced to Japan. 
Hayashi san, who set up the NGO Small Earth in rural Chiba, recognized that such landscape was fast disappearing from our rural areas in Japan due to depopulation and aging society. He decided to do something about it by allowing younger, able city folks who wanted to be closer to nature to pay a membership fee to come and work in the fields on weekends and holidays and reap rewards from the harvest each year, which may be a sack of rice or a bottle of sake and participate in various community activities, including parties. The areas in fact only about an hour and a half away from central Tokyo on a motorway that links the two areas directly below the sea of Tokyo Bay. So this is a map. Uh, you can see where the motorway goes directly between the two areas. The motorway is famous because it pops out of the sea halfway through what looks like a cruise ship here is a motorway stop with hundreds of restaurants and thousands of toilets. The stop is called Umihotaru, or the Sea Firefly. This is a clip from a film I made for the London Design Biennale exhibition earlier in the year. The film, which is available on view on YouTube, was about rural Japan but it ends ironically with this image of densely built up city of Tokyo with very little green, as you can see. I recently went to a talk event organized by Tank Magazine in which Harvard University professor Mohsen Mostafabi was speaking about his new book on Tokyo. He was highlighting a rather disturbing fact that Tokyo has the least amount of parks and greenery compared to other cities in the West and a handful of corporations still has a monopoly on large urban developments in the city. So the city becomes built up with little consideration for the well-being of masses of people living in the city. Very little is created in terms of public realms, trees are cut down unnecessarily, access to canals and rivers is not very well thought out, tall residential towers are hardly affordable for most people. Due to such factors, Japanese people who live in cities have a very strange relationship with nature, Morrison said. City people in Japan are cut off from nature in a way that city people in the West are not. And what this talk on Tokyo made me realize, and by the way, I am uh, from Tokyo myself, is that I was looking for points of resistance in my research work. There may be small points, but here are people who are tackling issues such as de depopulation, aging society, working against huge economic imbalance that exists in our society and doing something about it. The question for me is not what can we do, but why aren't we doing anything? Perhaps we feel overwhelmed, but we are, each one of us can be the force of change, be the point of resistance. Mohsen has a website called japanstory.org. I recommend you visit it. I found a very good interview with a Japanese architect, Toyo Ito. Mr. Ito talks about the relationship between cities and regional areas of Japan. He says, and he hopes that, cities and regional areas might become one day more mutually inclusive. It is exactly what many of our speakers here today will touch on. So it's about coexistence or kyozon. Perhaps we need to embrace a new kind of existence, maybe a hybrid form of existence. If you are the person with more power, then we need to be careful not to bulldoze our way through the fragile ecosystem that we have here on Earth, and but, but learn from it. As Mr. Hayashi will tell you, nature does not produce any waste. So um, I'm very excited to introduce you to our speakers. 
We start with Christian Dimmer, who teaches urban studies at Waseda University, joining us from Tokyo. Chris will contextualize the rural urban situation in Japan. Then we have two presentations, one by Kyoko Wainai, who has recently returned back to Japan after living here in the UK for some 30 years to live in Akita, northern part of Japan, and set up a creative hub called Life Laboratory Tohoku. Next, we have Junko Kunihiro, um, an ex-banker turned ex-architect turned town manager who has been helping local councils revitalize areas of Tokyo, which has become depopulated and run down. We will then have our first keynote speaker, Tomoaki Uno, a Japanese architect based in Nagoya. Uno has set up his own office about 30 years ago and has steadily built up a huge range of one-off houses, always working closely with artisans. I will host the Q&A with Uno-san. <clears throat> we will start the afternoon session with Tatsuya Tanaka, a local businessman who helped to launch Zero Waste Town Kamikatsu Village in Shikoku followed by a panel discussion with Alice Ijali from Assemble, who was one of the lucky three to visit Kamikaze Village, and Ruth Lang, whose recent book, Building for Change, the Architecture of Creative Reuse, Future Kamikaze Village. So this will be followed by the final, oh no, sorry. <laughs> this will be followed by presentation from international scholars working in rural Pakistan, Mongolia, China, Namely, Mavi Maza, Corinna Dean, Kent Mandel, Cyan Chang, Chen Zhang. The panel discussion will be chaired by Shin Egashira, who teaches here at Architecture Association. Symposium will conclude with a final key, keynote from Yoshiki Hayashi, the founder of NGO Small Earth, followed by a Q&A session with a local London-based Japanese architect, Takeshi Hayashi, Hayatsu. We will celebrate the end of symposium with drinks, so please join us. Briefly, I would like to say thank you to Toto Europe for sponsoring our symposium. Thank you to AA for giving me the opportunity to organize this event and the events team at AA, Manije Vanjis and Harriet Jennings for supporting me throughout. Thank you also to a friend and a project manager extraordinaire, Hiromi Kikuchi, who has been on my side a quiet force, a quieter force, <laughs> helping me uh, get organized and speaking to various participants in Japan on my behalf. She is currently preparing for a PhD to research into core design in urban planning and urban transition. Finally, um, I can't see them here, but um, I would like to draw your attention to the beautiful set of paintings on the wall by David Phillips. The paintings depict the rural landscape or Satoyama from Kyushu, where David was an artist in residence. So thank you very much. Enjoy your day.